Hello. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity that you have given me to talk about planetary health and why it is the new paradigm that we need for the era of COVID-19 and climate change. And let me begin by acknowledging the times where we are in right now. I'm pretty sure that many of us are still very much concerned about potential future waves of COVID-19. There might be another Omicron-like surge if we do not enhance vaccine coverage, not only in our country, but around the world. But also, I think we should not forget and ignore that there are not just future waves, but future tsunamis of climate change and biodiversity collapse and all the other myriad planetary challenges that will impact the health of human populations, as you can see in this caricature. And indeed, we now live in the epoch or the era of the Anthropocene. Anthropo, uh, as you may be aware, means uh, humanity, man. And we now live in this century where the, fa the major force that is shaping the face of the earth is not a natural phenomenon, but human activities such as our consumption patterns, the demographic shifts that we see around the world, especially urbanization, and technological advancement. And as you can see in this diagram, all of these drivers are then leading to uh, a wide array of environmental challenges such as global pollution to the air, water, and land, biodiversity loss, climate change, of course, and many others. And all of these will eventually and are already impacting the health of human populations. On your right, you will see the many different uh, disease groups uh, that are going to be exacerbated by these environmental challenges, malnutrition, infectious diseases such as COVID-19, and many other uh, diseases, non-communicable diseases, heart disease, diabetes, cancers, displacement and conflict, because these environmental challenges will lead to uh, the forced movement of uh, entire populations, and mental health, because these challenges, these environmental problems are also affecting our brains and hearts as well. And so these are the different changes that we are now seeing in the epoch of the Anthropocene, where health is very much affected. And unfortunately, this is the state of our world today. As you can see in this series of line graphs, everything is going up. CO2 emissions as a result of our addiction to fossil fuels for electricity generation, among others. Ocean acidification, the water in our oceans, in our seas, is becoming more acidic. And we, we know that acidity uh, kills uh, fingerlings and coral reefs, which are the forests of the ocean. And rapid deforestation is still happening uh, in many different parts of the world, as well as uh, the depletion of uh, clean water, especially in rivers and lakes, as well as fertilizer use. Uh, in the name of large-scale agriculture, we've been pumping artificial nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium into our soils, therefore uh, destroying the natural cycles of these elements. And so if these uh, you know, challenges will continue, we need to start you know, treating not just human illness, but also planetary illness. And as a physician, I always say that I now have two patients. On one hand, you have uh, that kid wearing a face mask, trying to protect herself from the unseen coronavirus. And on the other hand, you have Mother Earth also wearing a face mask, but of course, not trying to be uh, safe or protected from COVID-19, but to be safeguarded from the myriad ecological damages that we are inflicting on her as a, a result of our human activities. And so that is how the concept of planetary health was born. In planetary health, we now have two patients, not just the people, but also the planet as well. And planetary health, if we're going to uh, you know, popularize it in the Philippines. If we are going to communicate this to a Filipino audience, the way I usually uh, simplify it is that planetary health is ang agham ng lahat. And lahat, as you can see, is an acronym. L, 
lupa, a, araw, h, hangin at hayop, a, ako, t, tubig at tao. Ang lahat ay magkaugnay, sabi nga ng awitin ni Joey Ayala. And so planetary health is the science of lahat. And if we are going to address lahat, all these aspects, we need a truly transdisciplinary approach. Indeed, planetary health is what has also been described as the grand convergence. Because as you can see in this diagram, it's really the convergence of many concepts and paradigms and frameworks and disciplines that we are already familiar with. International health, tropical medicine, global health, eco-health, uh, preventive medicine, social medicine, earth sciences, systems thinking, and even ethics because planetary health is an invitation for us to ask the difficult questions that govern our relationship with Mother Earth, with animals, and with all the other uh, aspects or components of our planet Earth, our only home. And this might be the first time you're hearing or learning about planetary health. It might sound new to you. But the concept of planetary health, the idea that the health of people and the health of the planet are inextricably intertwined, it's not a novel invention. We just need to listen to indigenous communities, go back to ancient wisdom, and we will discover that this idea that the health of people and the health of the planet are inseparable is something that has been embraced by indigenous communities for centuries, if not millennia. According to Chief Seattle, an indigenous leader of the Americas, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Of course, in planetary health, we want to uh, diagnose the health of the planet. In the health sciences, we have many different metrics and indicators that are used to describe the health of people, life expectancy, infant and maternal mortality, among others. But for planetary health, one of the frameworks that has, have, has been uh, developed uh, in order to diagnose the health of the planet is the planetary boundaries framework that was created by the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden. And as you can see in this diagram, um, there are nine planetary boundaries, boundaries that cannot be violated, boundaries that need to be preserved, because if we don't do so, uh, life on Earth, uh, especially for humanity, will be uh, less and less possible. Unfortunately, according to the Stockholm Resilience Center, as you can see in this diagram, out of nine planetary boundaries, five have already been breached or violated. They are the ones in orange. And what are they? So as you can see, first, uh, climate change. Unfortunately, if we do not really address our carbon emissions, we are not on track to achieve the, uh, the targets of the Paris Agreement by 2030. That is the deadline given to us. Biosphere integrity has also been violated because over the past century, we've seen the fastest rate of extinction of creatures great and small. Land system change or land use in you know, land use because um, in the past century, we've also transformed our forests, our natural ecosystems into cities, subdivisions, um, casinos, hotels, and many other uh, forms of uh, human habitation. As I already alluded to you uh, about uh, the biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus, which unfortunately have already been greatly disrupted, again, because of our pumping of artificial fertilizers into the soil. And finally, much more recently, it was discovered that the planetary boundary for novel entities has already been uh, breached as well. And when you say novel entities, these are chemicals that we manufacture in the laboratory and we release into the environment. And one of these novel entities that we've uh, already released to the environment in, in massive amounts uh, is plastic. And um, you might have heard uh, a few months ago that plastic or microplastic has not only been found um, in the environment, you know, in turtles, for instance, uh, but also inside uh, the human body in the bloodstream. And so 
Unfortunately, these five boundaries have already been violated. Our challenge is to reverse the uh, violation of these boundaries and to make sure that no other boundary will be further violated to make sure that life on earth uh, will continue to be possible. But of course, it's not just about preserving the planet's boundaries. We need to make sure that the planet Earth is also sustaining life and well-being for uh, human populations. And that's why there is this um, British economist, uh, Kate Rayworth, who developed the concept of the donut economy. As you can see, this diagram looks like a donut. There is an external or outer circle that represents the planetary boundaries or the ecological ceiling that I just described to you a while ago in the previous slide. Meanwhile, the inner circle pertains to the social foundation, things that uh, are aspects that uh, we need to uh, fulfill, provide to people uh, in order for them to live healthy and happy lives, water, food, health, education, income, political voice, gender equality, housing, energy, and many others. And the goal of the donut economy is to make sure that we redesign our current economic model into one that protects the planetary boundaries, but at the same time, that does not lead to shortfalls in the social foundation. We cannot go beyond the boundaries. We cannot go below the social foundation. And so this is really the greatest challenge of our humanity today in the era of planetary health, how to make sure that we are creating an economy and a society that is a safe and just space for humanity. So now I'll shift gears. We've talked about planetary health, the fundamentals, the frameworks, the way we measure the health of the planet, and the imperative of protecting the planet while at the same time meeting the needs of everyday people. I am going to now focus on climate change as one of the major planetary health threats, as I've already described to you a while ago. And in this diagram, you will see that climate change is going to affect the health of human populations in many different ways. There are multiple arrows, a lot of boxes, just to demonstrate to you that climate change through storms and droughts and flooding and heat waves will be affecting our health uh, and the health of our children and of the future people of the world. And on the right, you will see that there is really no single disease group that is going to be immune to climate change. I already mentioned uh, them to you a while ago, uh, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases like heart disease and lung diseases. Nutritional status will be reversed if climate change will continue to uh, worsen. And again, mental health is also being affected. There's growing evidence that our mental health is being impacted by climate change already. So of course, in the Philippines, we're very familiar about um, you know, climate-related extreme weather events such as typhoons and intense flooding. When they occur, not only buildings, school buildings, uh, hospitals, uh, farmlands, um, you know, markets are being affected, houses, of course, but also the health of people uh, and all the, um, you know, even creatures, animals uh, and plants that live and thrive in these communities. This is a picture that was taken in 2013 when Typhoon Haiyan, the strongest typhoon to ever hit land in human history, uh, occurred in uh, Western uh, Visayas. And during this pandemic, over the past two years in the Philippines, we have uh, experienced the confluence of two crises happening at the same time. On one hand, you have uh, COVID-19, and on the other hand, you have climate change. And imagine you are a poor Filipino living along the coastlines or along the corridors of the typhoon, and you may have encountered the you know, dual uh, effects of these uh, two crises. On one hand, do I stay in the house to protect myself from the unseen coronavirus with a, uh, with, with a house or the roof of the house uh, being blown away by the strong wind or the interior of the house being uh, inundated uh, by intense uh, flooding. On the other hand, do I move to these evacuation centers? As you can see, there's no social distancing 
uh, to begin with in these uh, cramped uh, locations. And there's a very high chance that you will contract uh, COVID-19. And so this is a real dilemma that was encountered by many of our uh, fellow Filipinos uh, during this pandemic. Apart from extreme weather events like typhoons and flooding, the, our region, Asia, and in including the Philippines, is going to in, experience uh, hotter temperatures in the coming years and decades, as you can see in these diagrams. And so this is not just an issue anymore for places like Europe and North America that experience intense heat waves over the past several months. In the future, we will also be experiencing it, uh, experiencing it as well in our uh, region within our own backyard. And it's interesting that there are cities around the world, including Los Angeles and even Athens, Greece, that are already appointing chief heat officers in order to prepare uh, their communities to uh, enhance their resilience, uh, not to typhoons, but to extreme heat events. Another issue that is going to be very, very uh, serious, uh, especially in a country like the Philippines, is sea level rise. We know that the level of the sea continues to rise as the um, ice caps uh, in the Arctic and Antarctic continue to melt because of climate change, but also the warming of the ocean uh, continue, makes it uh, uh, expand even further. And when the sea level continues to rise, the seawater begins to enter um, our land, intrudes into freshwater systems. In fact, in the Philippines, we are seeing the fastest rate of sea level rise in the world, five times that of the global average. And there's growing evidence that when people living in the coastlines begin to uh, consume or drink water that is high in salt, there is a very high risk of uh, getting these different disease conditions, hypertension and preeclampsia and gestational hypertension uh, or miscarriage, infant and neonatal mortality rising, again, because of the increased salt consumption derived from uh, drinking water. And if uh, the um, uh, sea level rise continues to worsen, because of unstoppable climate change, not only that your water will become uh, highly salinized, but also entire communities may need to even relocate. You know, they will be forcibly displaced because of uh, coastal flooding. And this is some. This is a projection for Metro Manila that by 2050, the city will be underwater if climate change is not going to be averted. I already mentioned to you a while ago that climate change affects our mental health as well. We know that when extreme weather events like typhoons happen, the victims do experience uh, post-traumatic stress that may be overcome uh, within a short period or may last for a lifetime. But also there is a growing recognition of the slow onset impacts of climate change on mental health and there's actually a new concept called eco-anxiety or climate anxiety that is now beginning to be uh, noticed and observed, especially among young people around the world, that is being investigated now by psychologists and other uh, researchers. In fact, in a very recent uh, survey of young people uh, in 10 countries, what was found out was that the Filipino young people are the most climate anxious in the world. Around 90% of young people are at least moderately to at most extremely worried about their, their climate unstable future. And of course, I already mentioned a while ago that infectious diseases are also very much susceptible uh, to uh, changes and increase as a result of climate change. The planet's health is essential to prevent infectious disease and we know that the next pandemic uh, may just be lurking around in one of our forests or uh, residing in our animals. And that's why we need to address the upstream drivers of emerging infectious disease. We need to stop deforestation. We need to stop impinging into natural ecosystems. We need to uh, regulate 
and uh, wildlife trade, we need to be more responsible in our uh, animal production or meat production even in order to reduce the likelihood, the chance that another virus will be jumping from an animal to a human being. And there's even a growing um, recognition that climate change in itself will be increasing the likelihood of another zoonotic spillover when a virus or a pathogen jumps from an animal to a human being. And uh, in this study, very recent study, as you can see, our region, Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, is going to be a pandemic hotspot. And you know, we've talked already about the health impacts of climate change, and that should be a call for all of us, especially the health professions, to step up and address climate change. But we also need climate action in other sectors, in urban planning, in electricity generation, in our transport systems, in the industry, in agriculture and forestry. All of these sectors will need to change their behavior, will need to reduce their emissions, will need to act on the climate in order to protect the climate, in order to also generate health benefits for our people. I'm sure that this diagram is something that you're very familiar with. We need to keep on um, flattening the curve of COVID-19 through myriad protective measures in order to not exceed the healthcare system's capacity. But we also need to keep on increasing our capacity by adding more beds, by recruiting more nurses and uh, other health professionals, by rolling out more vaccines, and I think this mantra of flattening the curve is also very relevant to the planetary crisis that we are facing now. We need to flatten the curve of our carbon emissions in our ecological footprint. But unlike the previous curve, this curve has the Earth's capacity that is not changeable, it's constant, it's fixed, and therefore it's non-negotiable. Remember, there are planetary boundaries that we need to protect. And so our task for planetary health is much more challenging because we cannot negotiate with, the, with Mother Earth. Can you expand your capacity? Can you move your planetary boundaries? And the only action that we need to do or that we can do is to flatten our curve if, in, to bend our emissions and our footprint. And so I would like to invite all of you to be part of the emerging, the growing planetary health community. This is uh, the Planetary Health Alliance. I invite you to visit the website of the Alliance and I invite you to join our upcoming conference uh, in November uh, in Boston. And we need to start embedding planetary health into the education, not only of college students and graduate students, but of all citizens at all levels, from the young to young at heart. Because planetary health education will restore that lost and broken interconnection within nature uh, that unfortunately uh, pervades in our society, in our community uh, today. As you can see in this diagram, interconnection within nature is central to planetary health education. And that's why in the Philippines, we started the first planetary health program in the country uh, at the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine. And also we created a network, a community called Planetary Health Philippines. I invite you to Google planetaryhealth.ph so that you will find out the faces and the voices of this growing planetary health community in the Philippines. The, this community is international, it's intersectoral, interdisciplinary, and also intergenerational because we have young people and uh, people who are young at heart who are members of this community. I invite you to join us. And our dream is that is for the Philippines to become not the Silicon Valley. You're familiar with Silicon Valley in California, which is the epicenter of technological innovation. But we want to be the Silicon Islands of planetary health innovation because I firmly believe that the Philippines can share a lot of lessons to the rest of the world in terms of not just the problems themselves, but the planetary health solutions that the world uh, direly needs. 
And I was also very privileged to co-establish another center for planetary health, the Sunway Center for Planetary Health, based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And this center hopes, aspires to recast the partnership between people and planet so that both can thrive. And it's based at Sunway University, which aims to become the first planetary health-oriented university in the world where planetary health is being taught to all students regardless of discipline and profession. You can be a nurse, you can be an accountant, you can be a chef or an engineer, and you will be receiving planetary health education because we want to prepare the next generation of planetary health leaders, stewards, and citizens. And I hope that every university in the world will follow this example. So I'm now wrapping up my talk and I want to quote, and I remember uh, the great Indian novelist, Arun Hati Roy, who wrote this at the beginning of this pandemic. The pandemic is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And each time we enter a new door, we move to a new location, we look for the destination, we use uh, a gadget, a device, we use a compass. And unfortunately, in the 21st century, of course, no one uses a compass anymore. Instead, we all use a Google map. So what is the Google map for the future? And I believe that Google map is planetary health the Google map towards a green, healthy, and just post-COVID recovery. We need to make sure that as we recover and heal from this pandemic, we are able to create a green, healthy, and just future. We cannot go back to the old normal because that's abnormal. We need to create the truly new normal. And we can only do that if we will renovate the political economy of planetary health we need to shift away from this idea that the economy is uh, can limitlessly grow. You know, we can continuously consume and produce and draw that uh, line that uh, is uh, uh, limitless, that that reaches infinity. And instead, we need to start adopting a donut economy model, a donut economy mindset that respects the planet's boundaries while at the same time ensures the health and well-being of our people. Planetary health is also an invitation to planetary humility. It invites us to shift away from this ego-logical perspective. Oh, we are at the, at the top of the pyramid of nature. We can kill, consume, mine, extract, contaminate, pollute, and instead, we need to shift towards a truly ecological approach where we see ourselves as being part of nature, of the fabric of nature, and we are living in harmony, in solidarity, in greater interdependence with all creatures great and small and all the other components of planet Earth are only home. And finally, planetary health asks us to become good ancestors. This is another fantastic book. And what we want is that by 2122, which is 100 years from now, the children of 2122 will read the history books, will look back to the past, and they will say that the COVID and climate generation, which is all of us, have been good ancestors to them because we made the right decisions not just for our own health, but also for, for their health and well-being as well. We are not selfish ancestors. We are good ancestors to these children and to the future children of the world who are yet to come. So together, let's advance the health of both people and planet. Thank you very much. <music>